Uh, it is going to be a whirlwind tonight. Uh, I did a bit of a run through this afternoon. I looked at the content, uh, and uh, I'm going to prep you for it um, in a minute here. So, uh, before uh, before we start, um, I think we're taking databases. You might just have finished databases. You've done some modeling, ERD modeling. I think you've done some business process. Uh, management, VPN pieces, you talk about strategy, information systems, you're going to be talking about um, analytics, data storytelling, and, and, uh, and BI, business intelligence, and other stuff. So, what I'm trying to do tonight is weave uh, a little bit of those messages in here. But before we start, let's just talk about data. So I just mentioned the word, like, what the heck is data? So let's come to some agreement as to terms. Um, and I am going to be using my notes tonight because uh, when I looked at this content, there was a lot, so um, I, I'm not able to memorize it all. Uh, individual facts, figures, observations, retain for analysis, um, and use, use, utilization. So, great, uh, it's, it's individual facts and figures that we're storing as data. Um, how can it be leveraged? Uh, so, how can we leverage this data to provide some insights and some value? So, I've just thrown up an example uh, on the right hand side. Uh, this is a very classic case. This is John, uh, John Snow. Uh, he was basically having a challenge with a cholera outbreak in London in August 1954. And he thought, hey, uh, I need to mark up where all of these cholera cases are. I'm going to put them on a on a graph, and I'll use an actual plot sitting map to do that. And he utilizes data, the observations he's got, he puts it on the map, and lo and behold, he identifies the red dot there, which is a well. A well that's producing bad water, causing the cholera outbreaks. Great, he finds it uh, and saves at least, you know, so that you don't have another 100 or 200 people to come up with cholera. So, I think that's a pretty good example of how he used data, uh, observations, collected them, put them on it, organized them, uh, organized it, collected it, organized, and then utilized it for a bit of fat. So, um, and this, as Tim mentioned, this, is, this happens all the time. And I think this can happen more. We're going to talk, uh, talk a little bit uh, tonight about that. If you leave this room and you're like pumped about data, uh, and you become what I call a data knot, I think you've heard of astronauts, I want you to become data knots. It's just like, man, the world is just all about data. And if we can do this better, we can make this world a better place. So that's my hope, because maybe one of you leaves this room tonight thinking, this is a career for me. Uh, I need to focus my business career around data and what, uh, and what that means. As we go through, uh, as we go through tonight, please think about what are the challenges with it. Lots of challenges with data. Uh, you may have experienced already through some of your classwork. Uh, there's lots of challenges in business with data, and then also think about how databases, which you've just taken, fits into this topic. Quick review of the importance. I believe uh, data is like extremely important to um, mankind. Uh, whether it is uh, using um, tau sticks to maybe identify antelope and under, understand how many antelope we've killed uh, back to 43,000 years ago, uh, clay tablets that have been used to record food rations in uh, Mesopotamia, and these databases or this data, these products aren't digital, but I'm not differentiating, uh, it's basically collecting and it's uh, organizing and utilizing data for good effect. Great. Uh, we have clay tablets, papyrus reads, obviously, and we have now Sanskrit coming out. We have written word. Uh, we've got um, a printing press that really uh, democratizes data as it relates to uh, thought. And how do I get my thoughts? I, I don't need to be a monk that only can replicate 40 pages a day maximum a day. I got something that can pump out 3,600 pages of content. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just like, wow, it's a 10 times uh, escalator in terms of information and data that can be replicated to the world. Card catalogs that need to organize and standardize across all these libraries so that 
You can go to one library, find the same books, that somebody else halfway across the world is going to find the same content if they're looking for it. Uh, we have now the introduction of digital uh, in terms of data and processing. So I think one of the pictures there is, is the old um, IBM uh, ENIAC or ENIAC. Um, by the way, um, this is an interesting thing. Have you ever heard of debugging? You have a code and you have debugging, I think. Uh, one of the things that happened was, uh, is they had manual relay switches and a butterfly got caught in one of the relay switches. And the program didn't work because it's using these electronic relays to do the program. And the term debugging comes from the actual physical removal of this butterfly from one of the relay switches. There you go. Uh, now you're going to win a trivia game. Um, and then, of course, like modern innovation, we have ChatGPT doing amazing uh, generative work uh, that has just been introduced lately. So I would say data is really at the core of all of these advancements, and we can see the uh, you know the commensurate, I believe, uh, civilization also um, uh, uh, basically advanced. And we'll go through a, a, a few things on that. All right, how do I do this? Like, how do I take 40 years of what I've experienced in this realm in data and give you a lowdown in 40 minutes? It's just like, I tried it this afternoon, not sure if I'm going to hit the 40 minutes. But what I have to do is really focus on maybe how you think about things. So that's what we're going to be concentrating on. How are you thinking about these topics? And I'm going to use uh, what are called uh, conceptual models. So conceptual models help you break down subjects, think about things more deeply. It's called decomposition. So we're going to go through these models, think about how you can use them to think about something more deeply, and then and, and basically come up with a possible solution. Okay? I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to give you a bit of a decoder. Okay, so what I'm doing is giving you decoding rings. You'll all leave this uh, face with some decoding rings, and you'll have the ability to think, think these through. I will give the caveat. Uh, George Box, uh, mathematician, uh, great term. Uh, all models are wrong. So we're going to give you some models. By the way, they're all going to be wrong. You're going to be like, oh, this is garbage. And I can see an exception here and that. All models are wrong. Some are useful. So some of these you can take away tonight and go, I'm going to be more into that. Like that one seems really relevant to what I want to do or what I need to do. And other stuff you're just going to throw away today, maybe come back later and like resurrect it because like, oh yeah, I remember how to think about this problem that I'm trying to approach. Does that make sense to everybody? So giving you concepts, not giving you masters today. Concepts are hard, so um, bear with me. Like this is this is going to be a bit of a whirlwind drive through. Okay. Bait. Let's talk a bit about bait. I've, I've used bait uh, quite a lot in the last 40 years. It's quite simple. Um, it allows you, um, I mean, what does this say? It basically says, let your thinking split your problem up into four components. Business, an application, uh, and then information, and a technology layer. Uh, if you're interested where this comes from, it comes from uh, TOGAF, the open group, uh, um, uh, the open group architecture framework, and it's called architecture uh, tiers or architecture levels, whatever. That's where it comes from. But um, think about the problem, the solution, whatever it is, the concept you have, into these four domains. And I think what you're going to find is it allows you to separate these concerns. So you've got business concerns. What are those business concerns? It's like, well, they have requirements. You're producing products. You probably have a process. Uh, you have an org structure, you have requirements, outcomes you're generating, value, strategy. You have this whole business dimension that allows you to dig into that. And that's like you're, you're in the business program. You're going to like, be experts in this. This is, this is sort of your domain, right? You're coming into a business, uh, business technology course and you're, you're thinking, well, what about those other things? How can I get my business done? Utilizing applications, information, and technology in order to do nothing. So I want you to think about, this is my realm, but what are the components? What are the components of applications that I need to be thinking about? The users who are using them, it's called user-centered design, 
latency in the application, how fast is it, how quick does it need to be. Um, I've got <clears throat> redundancy, so I've got our functionality, does it do the thing I need it to do? Uh, is there an overlap in this application for, for another uh, you know, business problem that I have? Uh, your information, so you're, you're doing databases, so information is huge. You're thinking about the records, how are these are being stored and organized, your customers, your assets, the transactions, your inventory positions. How are you, where, if this is an industrial setting, if you're an oil and gas company, you've got measurements, you've got loads of industrial measurements that you need to store somewhere. So it allows you to split off into the characteristics of the information. Finally, the technology. Uh, technology and, and man, has there been a, <laughs> has there been an announcement in this since I started? I started in like name frames and punch cards. That's what, when I started. But and since then, since I've started, uh, we've got client servers, we've got virtualization, cloud computing. I think somebody talked about cloud computing, so at least you've heard that term. But man, has the advancement in technology come. It's actually gotten a lot cheaper to compute. It used to be you only had large, very large organizations that could afford uh, the computers it took to do the computing. You saw, you saw the ENIAC. It was literally a monstrosity that only the government could actually afford to build to something everybody thought of home, and that thing is much smarter than, than that ENIAC was back in 1946. So think about the cost of technology coming down and also the computer. So why is this useful? Um, uh, I use it to break an application down into its components. So um, I'm speaking not to students, I'm speaking to business leaders, okay? That's my frame of reference. This evening, you are business leaders. In five years, in 10 years, maybe you're an individual contributor, maybe you're leading a group of other business people in that particular area. So think of the way I'm sort of framing this up in that aspect. You're not a student anymore, you're gonna be a future business leader. So you need to think about um, these characteristics. What applications are you actually using in your business to support? How is the information uh, you know, being utilized? Um, so that's sort of micro level, and I use it also on a macro level to understand uh, in an enterprise, in a company, um, let's say that you've got uh, HR, and you've got finance, and you've got supply chain, you have all these functions, and they're each independently potentially using different data, uh, they have different programs and applications that they're doing this in, uh, you can get a very complex organization uh, that, that occurs because you actually haven't leveraged uh, perhaps what's available in another application. And so you get this sprawl, um, I don't know if you call it, you'll hear IT sprawl or application sprawl or whatever. This is like a pandemic that's going on in organizations every day because they really haven't taken a really good, uh, really good view. And hindsight's always 2020. Uh, so when you're, when you're in the midst of things, you just like buy it and you, act, you, know, you implement it, you put it in, and then you think you're gonna clean it up afterwards. Sorry, the cleaning up afterwards never works, uh, and you never have time to implement it correctly. So as business leaders, this is gonna be one of the beings in your existence to be like, okay, like it's so complex to get work done in the organization, how do I simplify? Uh, so this will help you, I think, allow you to simplify and think about your business. So uh, this is called the DIKY pyramid. Uh, so I use this quite extensively. Um, what is it saying? Uh, it says uh, a few things. One is, there is no shortcut to wisdom. Sorry, I, I just don't get wise overnight. Data requires context to be informative. Information requires meaning to know and trust what it's telling you. And knowledge becomes actionable when given insight. So that's what it's saying. Like, this is a layered, this is a layered pyramid. I need a good foundation foundation of data, those facts and figures and signals, I need it to be well organized and structured, I need these, that, that basically information to be, uh, you know, to basically uh, to understand them, to compare them, to think them out, to discuss them, and then finally I need to be able to understand them and use them uh, in business, in, uh, in, uh, even in your own home life. So, um, so that's what this is, is representing is, uh, you don't instantly become wise. 
sometimes they say, oh, it takes, uh, it just takes a long time, it takes experience to do that, and I would suggest this can help you get your organization, the people that are working in your organization or even yourself, higher, quicker to the top of the pyramid they, than maybe it would have taken otherwise. So um, think about how you can get to the top of this pyramid quicker. And we're going to, there's another slide that we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, why is this useful and how can you use it? So about a house of cards. So think of the house of cards. You've got data at the bottom. Uh, let's say that the data has uh, bad quality. Not that any organization would have bad quality <laughs> information. Or redundant information. Or even misleading information. Just like, hey, I've got record A that says this and B that says this. Which one is correct? And so we spend, organizations spend tons of time trying to, trying to um, get that bottom layer correct. And it's really tough. And it's a bit of a house of cards. What it means is the data is not correct. It's effectively garbage in, garbage out. Um, it's, it's not going to be useful, or I may make decisions, or I'm going to be slow uh, because of it. So I talked a little bit about that bottom rung. So we're going to blow that out a bit. This is, uh, this is called um, the Dama Wheel. Uh, so Dama is an organization that promotes the uh, effective use of management of data. And um, uh, so what is this saying? Uh, one thing it's saying is data is valuable and managing data is complex. I think you can see that, right? So you thought like, oh, the database was only a small piece of the pie. And it is. It's actually for community. Sorry. You thought databases were the whole thing. It is not. It's a very small piece of the pie. Maybe it's in that data storage and operations piece. You know, when you're doing your database, maybe it's a little bit of the ERD modeling that you did. It's in that data modeling design. So you've probably got some experience in two of these pieces, two quadrants, or two pieces of this pie. There's so much, so much other pieces of this pie that's required. I talked about data quality already. This again is going to be a bane of your existence as business <laughs> leaders uh, because you're going to be uh, dealing with uh, data that isn't great quality. How do we improve the quality? Who's responsible for the quality of the data? How the heck does this bad quality data get in our databases anyways? And, and so there's going to be lots of conversations you're going to have. Um, you're going to be utilizing data warehousing and business intelligence to extract the value of the data. And there's going to be a whole bunch of more advancement. I see a ton of advancement in technology. You can see it with uh, uh, the uh, generative uh, AI that you can see now, and as well as what I call AGI, so artificial general intelligence. And that's just going to blow that piece out of the water. In fact, I'd say Dame is a little old in the fact that they haven't really split up the data warehousing and business intelligence really to show how much uh, intellectual capital is going into that space right now to utilize the data to understand it and, and really to go out that data information knowledge uh, wisdom um, pyramid. Uh, I love this quote, there's no such thing as a free lunch. It came kind of uh, origins were back to the dirty 30s, the 1930s. Man, this is, this is totally uh, correct for data. Do not assume that you're going to be using data and that it's going to be clean uh, and that it uh, doesn't need to be managed. It's an absolute asset that you need to, although it might not be on your, um, it might not be on your balance sheet, um, I would suggest it probably should be. Uh, there's some accounting, uh, there's some accounting discussions that say, yeah, we need to record uh, you know, that as an asset. But I would say you need to treat it with that because it's, it's critical core to the organization. You can certainly tell how it impacts an org when maybe you have a cybersecurity incident and your data is not readily available or it's trapped or somebody's got a, a little bit of a key and they won't uh, open up uh, the crypt uh, until you give them some money to do that. So you certainly start seeing how much uh, um, value your data has when that occurs. So I'm keeping th throwing these concepts up, right? So we've done uh, data, we've done pyramid, we've done. Uh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. Um, 
Think of this as being the uh, upper, starting to get into the upper echelon of that uh, BIPW pyramid. So what is it saying? Uh, it says moving up the pyramid is hard. It doesn't just happen by providing, uh, it doesn't just happen. Uh, so there's three concepts in here, explicit, uh, explicit, implicit, and tacit knowledge. So let's think about that, I'm going to break that up for you a little bit. Explicit knowledge is the stuff that you've just done in your database, uh, or the, the database piece of your uh, uh, material that you've done. So explicit would be things like, this is your documents and manuals and uh, databases themselves and records and notes and all the things that, uh, that you might need. I think the battery might be going. Is that oh, back on. Little internet, that's uh, that's okay. So um, explicit is is uh, is definitely defining. You can see it's at the top of the iceberg, um, and I would suggest it's probably, even though it sounds hard, it's probably one of the easiest things uh, that you actually are able to do, developing uh, a consistent place to store the data that's easily accessible by the rest of your organization. Um, it's also saying that you're going to need to provide multiple ways for people to gain knowledge and wisdom. Okay, so. If just the tip of the iceberg is defining, uh, you know, what, um, people don't just need what, they need how and why as well. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that you start uh, your first job. You sit down uh, at your job and your boss hands you a 300-page manual and says, welcome to the company, uh, good luck, and they're gone. Wow. Okay. Like, how do I know? Like, how do I know what I'm supposed to do day to day? Uh, that's going to be a bit of a beast work if you just have to get all of that information out of that explicit knowledge. It's there, but like, how do you internalize it? How do you think about it? And how do you know that you're doing your job right? Uh, but that's it. That's all you got. Okay. So that's scenario one. Scenario two is uh, you've got that. You, know, you start. Boss hands you the document, but he also says, hey, we signed you up for uh, some courses, a course, you're going to go in, you're going to get some instructor-led training, you're going to be able to ask questions, and uh, you're going to be able to test it up. You're going to be able to like do exercises, kind of like what you're doing in education right now, but you, you can be educated. Here's the manual, and then here's the, here's the courses and coursework that you need in, in order to really start understanding what this is about. So that's second one. Uh, third scenario is you join a company, you get the manual, you go on the courses, and you're assigned a coach, maybe a TA, a mentor, uh, a peer to help you answer questions one on one basis or maybe in a group setting, whatever it is, in order to do that. So, of these three scenarios, we've just gone through the explicit, the manual, the implicit, is so like knowing how, uh, having the ability to sort of test out these ideas, and then finally talk to your mentor or your TA or like, why is it this like it is? I need to understand this more in order to actually take action on it. So think about, um, think about when you're developing your databases or whatever data that you've got is you're not done. Okay, just because the data is available does not mean other people know how it needs to be, you know, how it needs to be used or why it needs to be you know, used the way uh, that it is. Uh, why that's really important. Catch up on my notes. Why that's really important is, and I'll come to the golden circle at the top. And by the way, I put uh, on the slides, I think, are these available for students after? The slides, yeah, okay. Um, at the top, any slide that I've got, like a material that I would say, hey, if you've got some spare time, you, want to, might, you, you, you might want to read this book, I put some book titles on the top of those. That's what those are. So, um, really, uh, you know, start with why Simon Sinek's book, super good at getting you to think about that golden circle. So, 
his premise is that you start with why. If you need to lead change, if you want to get somebody to understand something, you first talk about why. Why do you need to do this? Why are we doing this? Uh, why is this important to the organization? Next, we talk about how. This is how we're going to do it. This is why we do it. This is how we're going to do it. And, and we're going to work with this team and that team. And then finally, you talk about what. Okay, this is what you're going to do in order to do it. You're going to go to the screen and punch in these buttons and do this thing. And then you're going to go check this value. And, and then finally, you're going to submit a report. And, and that's it. So, you know, if you start out with what rather than the why, um, people uh, tend to forget. And they uh, tend to need guidance a lot because they actually don't understand why it is they're doing what they're doing. They, they, just, under, they just understand what uh, they're doing, not, not potentially the why. So it's really important. Um, and I'll call it a work to rule versus working to an outcome. If you just give them the what, people work to rule. Here's the rules. I'm going to follow the rules. If they find something that doesn't conform to the rules, guess what? Work stops. Uh, they'll either ask their bosses, uh, you'll ask somebody nobody knows, and um, things slow down. If you start with the why, yeah, um, it actually is a, a bit of a different mindset. It's not a work to rule, it's, a, it's a basically a work to, uh, work to an outcome. What, it is, what are we trying to do? Oh, we're trying to sell this product to a customer and have this good experience? Great, I don't find the rule, but that's okay. I know what it is we're trying to do for this customer. What a, what a good customer relationship looks like. And I'm not constantly seeking rules. I have a little more liberty in order to make decisions within certain guidelines in order to, you know, in order to, to move on and to do the thing. So a work to rule versus a work outcome, very different. And you'll find that in organizations. Those are that are extremely rigorous and have a lot of rules and not a lot of uh, not a lot of people don't understand why they're doing it. Tend to sort of get bogged down into that work to rule um, mindset. All right. Um, as we go through, by the way, bait was super easy. We're getting into harder and harder concepts. So I'm going to be slowing down a little bit um, as we go through this, just so that you understand what this is. Um, I think you took strategy, is that right? There was um, some a piece, a little bit of a piece of the work, like, uh, in other words, to me, strategy is all about winning. There is no such thing as strategy to fail. Uh, strategy is all about winning. Like, how do you win in the business environment? How does your company win uh, in terms of competition? Like, how do you get market share? Like, and how, you know, what's going to be really important to get the market share that you are? And by the way, uh, unless you're Elon Musk, and maybe that's not even a good one. Like everybody's limited in terms of their resources, their capital, the employees that they've got, uh, and what they can do, how big they are. Everybody is resource constrained. So in strategy, because you've got limited resources, not infinite, you need to choose what's important. Strategy is all about choosing what's important and what's not. And it's really important what's to know what's not as important as much as it is to know what's important. Uh, so that's that's basically my definition of strategy. Sorry if you're uh, if you're teaching on strategy, one of the uh, <laughs> teachers here I probably hack that uh, hack that a lot. But what um, join uh, John Boyd, by the way, um, just a little background on John Boyd. Um, amazing uh, fighter pilot came from uh, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. And finally, end up um, uh, basically advising the Secretary, uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, in um, uh, if you remember, um, uh, basically Storm, Storm and Norman and, uh, and the war that we had in uh, Afghanistan back in like the uh, '90s. So super, super smart, uh, super smart guy, brilliant guy. And uh, he had a book, by the way, it's at the top there. Not his book, but somebody else. Uh, the fighter pilot who changed the art of war. Um, and he used this term called UDA. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about UDA. Um, if we define UDA as being the cognitive process of acquiring, understanding, deciding, acting, and recording results, you can't see that. Acquiring, that's that, getting those observations, understanding, orienting, 
uh, all of these pieces of uh, information, acting, right, deciding, uh, deciding what we're going to do with this new piece of information. Well, maybe we don't do anything, as you can see. Maybe we actually do take an action on it. So this whole cognitive process of acquiring, understanding, deciding, acting, uh, recording the results is the key to winning. It's basically what he's saying. Those organizations, those pilots, and by the way, he was a pilot. Uh, he was very formative in uh, developing the F-15 uh, fighter pilot, F-16, and then the F-18 for fast maneuverability in, uh, in jets and fighter pilots. He literally went back to engineering school, got uh, an engineering degree in order to, to help develop this, uh, the aircraft. But his view is that success, either as a pilot, uh, you know, in a conflict or even competition between business people hinges on the ability for organizations, for pilots, or for organizations to go around this move faster. So those organizations that can do this move, they can observe, orient, decide, act, observe, orient, decide, act. By the way, if you talk to any fighter pilot that's come up with a cold way, and you mention the UDA loop to them, they will know exactly what you mean because they've been trained on it. All fighter pilots that go through, whether it's cold if or um, uh, in the States, a fighter pilot school. Uh, by the way, Navy SEALs do this as well, uh, and um, uh, Marines take this as well. So this is baked in to their training as, uh, as basically uh, people in the field. Um, and that's huge, like being able to react understand all of the things that we're seeing, understand what they need to do about it, decide, and decide to do nothing or decide to do something is huge. And those that can cycle that loop faster win. So we're going to come back to how this relates to data, because it totally relates to data. Um, his other side of it, so if you look at the, if you look at the negative, so that's a very positive aspect. Hey, those that can cycle through win. Those that can slow the loop down can also win that way. So let's say that you've got a competitor, maybe a combatant, right? You've got another fighter pilot, fighter pilot that you're against, uh, and uh, or you've got another business uh, that that you're competing against. Uh, in warfare, it's okay to actually cause the other loop to slow down, and so that's that's basically what this conjecture is. There's two ways to win. One is to make sure you're faster than your opponent, or you slow somebody else's loop down. Uh, and I'll just throw sort of like what we're seeing uh, in cyber warfare now, what we're seeing the elements of cyber warfare in uh, various armies and whatever. This is the key aspect of slowing down somebody else's somebody else's loop, loop, loop. So they're actually implementing it as saying, hey. We need to stop you from being able to cycle through uh, the OODA loop faster because that's actually a key to winning is by slowing you down in order to do it. So you can speed your own up, you can slow your opponents down. By the way, in business, we tend not to do this. You tend not to like go and attack a competitor or slow down the loops. Although, you know, some will like, I don't know, throw up some numbers that may be misleading. Um, or you know, divulge information or leak information that actually isn't correct, uh, but uh, that actually um, sort of diverts your competitors, or maybe uh, being not very opaque or transparent about what it is you're doing. So even in the business world, there's lots of, um, you do not want your competitors to know what plans you have, what actions you're doing, and even sort of like how you're operating as a company. So, I would say there's, there's a bit of that as well. So that's the key to winning. Why is it useful? Um, um, two things. Um, one is you can likely measure this. So I would say that you can probably measure all the way up from that observation, hey, we saw this happening. Uh, it took us this long to orient it. Uh, we, it took us this long to decide, and then this is the action we're taking. Uh, if that could be measured, um, I don't know if you've heard the term, if, uh, if you can measure it, you can manage it. 
but it actually allows you to drill into each of those components and say, why is it taking us so long to, uh, to get the information? Why is it taking us so long to decide these things or to act a certain way or to orient it? And I would say um, that's one key component of this, is that it actually allows you to measure how long you're taking or even the quality of the decisions that you're making. I will talk a little bit about the feedback. Hugely important to this is feedback. So I, uh, I observe something, I orient it, I go like, okay, that's how that fits into my new mental model. I decide to do, take an action, I take the action. We need to record the results. Was that actually good or not? So if it wasn't good, we need to be able to record that. Even though we don't like to, like to record failures or whatever, we need to do that. Because unless we do that, the next time we take a decision, it's not going to actually be right. Like we're not learning. And so the feedback loop there is extremely important uh, in order to actually utilize this. And so uh, there's, there's lots of work that has to be done to make sure that we're recording whether the decision was right, whether it was not right, what the, you know, basically what the outcome was. Uh, when the action was taken, or even not. Let's say we should have taken an action, then we should need to record the fact that we uh, sort of ignored the, um, uh, ignored the information. Um, just on this, um, good book. Uh, by the way, um, several thoughts on this if you're in psychology uh, or neuroscience is uh, the human brain or people are effectively prediction machines. So you, you are doing this, you've done this today. You did, you did this coming to class. You uh, understood, you, you observed what was going on in your environment, hey, is this slippery, is it not? Uh, you didn't even think about it, it's all probably subconscious. Mm -hmm. But you're observing your surroundings, is it safe, uh, you know, how am I gonna get here? Uh, you're oriented to, okay, I know how to get there, I've, I've recorded the map of, uh, I didn't know how to get there. This, this was new to me, so I had to reorient. That was new to me, but for you, it's like, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm in this building. I need to be here at a certain time. What's the time I'm in here? Uh, you're deciding, hey, can I stop for, can I stop for a coffee uh, before I come? You're predicting how long it's going to take, and then you're acting on it. So you literally are taking many, many, many of these loops, uh, and you don't even know it. Uh, because you're, you're cognitive. I mean, this is sort of like what it, what it means to have a brain uh, and actually to be taking action and doing things. So, um, so it's not so abstract that you actually can't, uh, that you actually can't consider it because you're doing it effectively every day. Uh, A.J. Agarwal, I think I mentioned here in Prediction Machines, is an economist that looks at, hey, um, now that we're developing machines that can effectively almost replicate the human brain, at least in terms of being able to predict outcomes and things that probably are faster, in fact, they are faster than what humans are doing, uh, in terms of now uh, sort of like uh, not just games that they're playing, but things that they're producing. Um, his view, and it's an extremely interesting one in terms of like what's up for the economy. As we, uh, as we uh, we're relying on people to do a lot of this uh, work in the, uh, in the past. Uh, now we're creating prediction machines, what let's call it AI, machine learning, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And what does he believe the impact will be on society and, and uh, other implications like that. And that's extremely relevant. You're hearing it in the news all the time. I don't know if you've heard of, uh, of some artists uh, who are complaining a little bit about the, uh, some images that were created by uh, the farmer's market, right? They were generative AI images, and the, and the artists were going like, oh, like, why didn't you use me? I'm a human. Like, why don't you use uh, you know, a, a, a chatbot or whatever to create it? And so uh, you get, you know, you, you're going to see a lot more of that. You're going to have uh, roles and knowledge workers that, you know, that was their, that was their main job. When I joined uh, Shell Canada in uh, 1987, we literally still had tech tools. We had tagging tools, there were people whose job it was to take paper uh, or to take notes and like tag them up and, on a nice script or memos and send them off the door. So uh, the personal computer certainly squeezed a whole bunch of like, that was then distributed. I think you probably have typed many, many times today not even thinking about it. Back then, that was a special skill uh, that people had. You were trained in it, you did like 90 words a minute. Uh, and how many pages you produced today was like 
pretty, uh, pretty instrumental to the success of the organization. So I use that just to, to contrast. Um, there's a lot changing, right? There's a lot changing. This loop is, is not getting slower, it's getting faster, and you just need to think about the role of data, because it's so critical to speed this, uh, speed this loop up. Let's talk about um, uh, a piece of that. I think you may have seen it. Uh, there was, probably can't see it there, but it's called analysis and synthesis is a key piece of that orientation, like how do I analyze and synthesize this information? Uh, this is the, what's called the analytics continuum. This lets you think about um, what the work is uh, required and the difficulty, the increasingly difficult techniques that are required to go up that particular uh, continuum. So I suspect part of your course you'll be doing some business intelligence work, right? You're going to need some data storytelling in BI. You're going to be doing stuff in that descriptive analytics. You're going to be describing maybe what happened. You're going to use a, a report or maybe create a dashboard in order that describes it. As you move up that chain, it gets much more sophisticated. Diagnostic, you're using your statistics to understand why the heck uh, did this thing happen? Uh, why, you know, why are we seeing what we're seeing? Predictive analytics, you're describing uh, what would happen. You're probably using machine learning. Uh, you've heard of these terms, machine learning or data science. Some people even use AI uh, for that particular piece. And then prescriptive analytics uh, helps you determine uh, what will happen, like what's the best thing that, uh, that we want to have happen. What's super interesting is this uh, used to be um, large companies. Like maybe large companies could do this and that's it. Uh, the cost of compute, way down. Everybody, uh, your cloud, uh, the cloud guy that came in here, man, you can spin up your own cloud instance on Azure or AWS, cheap, cheap, cheap. Big data, guess what? We get a lot of data. We get a lot of big data that you can use in order to compute against this. And the techniques are all open source. These machine learning models, uh, we have a lot of uh, available um, algorithms that have already been developed that you can use, whether they're TensorFlow, deep learning, machine learning. So if this convergence of bringing in cheap compute, lots of data, uh, machine learning models that are open source and open stack and I can use them, have really opened this up for you. Like you can literally go off and develop a uh, you know a predictive model on I don't know how many donuts you think that that Tim Hortons is going to sell this weekend. You can do that by doing some observation, collecting data, you know, developing a model to do uh, to do that. And um, I joke a little bit about that. Obviously, other organizations aren't looking at how many Tim bits. Well, Tim Hortons I hope is knowing how many uh, predict how many uh, donuts are going to sell in, in that. But other organizations are doing predicting on well, you know. How many, what's the equipment that's going to go down this weekend? What do I have to be prepared for uh, in order to have you know, uh, parts on supply and on order in order to do that? So lots of applications in this particular continuum. We're getting more, we're getting more in depth. We're almost at the end. Two more, two more slides. Pace layer. Think about, um, think about um, technology. This model says technology starts at the top, usually it's innovative, then it comes down to a differentiator. Hey, that technology that's useful is implemented in some, like for, for a, a bit of time, it differentiates, it's, you're able to compete with it, and after a while, it just becomes ubiquitous. It's, it's common, technology's there. I would say databases are probably there, at least um, already uh, you know, relational databases were in that category. It's down there. You can buy them uh, on Microsoft SQL Server. You can get them on cloud instances. They're just there. Uh, you know, they're, they're a commodity. Uh, whereas generative AI is probably in the systems of innovation piece. Like, uh, are companies really making money on generative AI? Well, the tech firms say that they are, uh, but um, are other companies utilizing it? And so, technology says that technology kind of goes from the top into the middle and to the bottom and that we need to actually think about that differently. One size doesn't fit all. How I treat generative AI should not be the same way as I treat a Microsoft SQL Server. Microsoft SQL Server, it's all about cost. 
I just, I just want to apply it. I want it to be robust. I don't want cheap generative AI. It's like, oh, we need to experiment with this. We have no idea what value uh, is going to be. And then once you experiment with it and there is some value, exploit it. Exploit it to the, to the fullest benefit. So the Gardner Pace layer, just throwing that out there. This is an eye chart. Uh, this is an eye chart. This is the full information management capability model that an organization likely has in order to run information. So where is your databases in there? You see that thing called EPMS at the very bottom? Oh, you saw that kind of, there we go, laser pointer. Uh, there you go. That's your little, that's your little Microsoft SQL database. Uh, you've got lots of other types of databases represented here. You've got lots of other things that are required. Why am I showing this? Um, this is complex. So yeah, you know, like you're, I know you're taking databases and I know you're taking ERDs, but this is, uh, you can spend an entire career, 34 years, and only attach maybe one or two or three of these horizontal lines, mm -hmm. and it will still keep you occupied or one of those verticals on data governance uh, and information security. Information security, by the way, is super, but if you want like the hottest job uh, right now, uh, it's either probably data science or it's like that cybersecurity person uh, doing that right now, so I, because it's super critical to make sure that our information is secure and organizations that don't, well, you see what happens when, uh, when they get locked out of their own data. If I were to go back in time and take different electives than what I took, I would have taken more psychology courses rather than math and physics. Okay? I was a computer science, a computer scientist. I loved math. I loved I loved physics, right? I loved those domains. I would have taken more psychology. So why is that? It's because the biggest barrier you're going to have to implementing your SQL uh, database that you've got is new application. Uh, the biggest challenges that you're going to have in the organizations for when something out aren't going to be about technology. They're not going to be about process. They're not going to be information. They're going to be about people. Mm -hmm. People are going to be your biggest barrier. You're going to be resistant to change. You are going to be uh, maybe you're an innovator, you're going to be in that top 2.5 or maybe even 13.5, but you've literally got 80 other percent uh, out there and more who don't want to change. Okay? So this is going to be, as future leaders, think about this. Like, this is going to actually be where you spend, this is where you're going to like bang your head <laughs> on the table because you're not able to do your work or you're not able to get work done in your organization. Why I put this up here is like start thinking about that aspect. Like what are the psychological and physiological aspects that make people resistant to change? So I'm throwing, throwing up a Maslow's hierarchy of needs to understand what people's needs are. If they lack air, food, shelter, water, guess what? Uh, love doesn't matter much. Self-actualization doesn't matter much. It's all about house of cards. They're only going to be thinking about Hey, I, I might lose my job. That's what that means. But like, I might lose my money. I might not be able to support my family, and their work productivity is going to go way down. And all that like love that you developed with your staff members in the past, because of you know cutbacks are coming, are going to be lost. So that's just an example. Uh, people are, are human. We're, we're like we have physiological and psychological needs. So you really need to understand those before you start with implementing new databases, or at least incorporate that into your robot plan. By the way, there's a whole bunch, I mean, if you want to like not do business career and you want to go into like change management or proxy or whatever, there's a whole discipline that will help you do this. But as business leaders, please engage good people who understand how to implement change in your organization because they'll be able to help you. All right. This is it. This is your final. Uh, this is your final application. Um, I want you to think about. In five years from now, you're going to be developing a business case for a purchase a new. Let's call it a quantum database. By the way, there is such a thing, a uh, quantum database, uh, and that's your. That's that's going to be your job. Maybe you run the IT department. Uh, maybe you're a part of that. But you're thinking about developing a business case for the purchase of it. 
What concepts have we just gone through? The sum of your head, so we've gone through many tonight. What concepts could you use to make your proposal? You're going to need to convince your boss, or maybe you're likely your boss's boss, because he'll bring you in, or she'll bring you into that meeting as well, because she'll have no idea uh, what you're talking about. So, like, what is that? What are these? Which ones that we've just talked about? Bates. Uh, we've talked about uh, data, uh, information, knowledge, wisdom. We've, we've talked about OODA loop. We've talked about a whole bunch of. What are you going to use to think about how you do that well? Or maybe take scenario B ten years from now. One of your staff members, you got a team, one of your staff members comes and says, you need to purchase a new quantum database. What's going to be your response? What's the conversation you're going to have with that staff member when they say, we need to do this? So, take a few minutes, think about like scenario A or B, um, or, or later tonight when you're studying more, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But this is, this is how you can apply it. Take these concepts, some will work, throw some, uh, you know, throw some away that won't. Uh, but I hope this was helpful for you to think a little more deeply uh, about data, its uh, application to business, and the criticality of it. Because uh, it's going be, it's, it's to be key, I, su I would suggest, for your careers, for being able to do the work that you need to do uh, for the next 40 years, as I bow out gracefully uh, from, from my 40 years. Thank you very much.